this song and I thought, wow, that is that is so awesome. We've got to learn that one. And um, it's um, it's real. Uh, it's, it should be really easy for you to learn. It's called an offering. And you know, as we think about Christmas time and we think about giving gifts and receiving gifts, um, I think of that verse that says that we're to give ourselves, offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice to God, which is our reasonable service. And you know, we can bring an offering, a gift of ourselves to the Lord and let Him control our lives. And He's worthy of our praise. So that's what this song is about. It's about uh, bringing ourselves an offering. It says, um, I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. And when you praise Him this morning, when you sing, He hears that. He receives that as a, as a sacrifice, an offering of your praise. So let's just learn this together. We're going to sing it a couple times, and I think you'll catch that catch on to it pretty quick. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Before Only by your blood and his 
uh, touch our voice today. It's a bit weak, Lord. Touch our, our spirit. Touch the heart of everyone that is here, Lord. Don't let the devil block them from hearing and, and retaining in their spirit what is needed for their life. And Lord, we do, as the, the, the new chorus is so beautiful that we sung today, Lord, we do seek to offer you an offering of praise to your name this day. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. The tale of two kings. When I think of uh, King Herod, Herod hated Christmas and he never heard the word. Think about it. The word Christmas hadn't been invented yet. It hadn't been spoken. We think of how Herod killed every male child two years and under. And that prophecy was fulfilled that there was a great mourning. For Rachel was mourning for her children, which were no longer alive. Herod was, was a, a man who was born into a politically well-connected family uh, coming out of Rome. And when he was only 25 years of age, he was named the governor of Galilee. Herod was a, a very well-connected man. And in 40 B.C., before the birth of Christ, the Roman Senate named him King of the Jews, which the Jews absolutely hated because he was not a religious man in any way. He was purely a man of, of, of uh, fleshly passions and he had no... <clears throat> no allegiance to anyone but himself, uh, which, which we'll bear out here as we move along. So I want us, first of all, to look at Herod the king. Um, and, and the reason we're doing this comparison this morning, and we're going to reiterate it, is we must ask ourselves, which king am I going to follow? Because the world, I believe, is following Herod's example today. But we are to follow Jesus' example. And we're going, to, we're going to look at both of them here this morning. First of all, there was four things about Herod the king that I, that I want to look at. The first thing I want you to notice is that Herod had a preoccupation with earthly power. As we described to you, whenever the wise men came, uh, the wise men, you need to understand, the wise men, we, we put them at the manger scene, but they were not there then. They came, Jesus was approximately one and a half to two years of age by the time they arrived. The shepherds came to a stable. The wise men came to a house because that's where they, they found Jesus. But they had traveled and, and they had tried to discover who, who this, this Messiah was. Uh, but Herod, Herod was, was, was a type of person who was so consumed with power that once he learned of this, he went through and slaughtered innocent babies. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like if someone from the government were to come to your house and, and were to take your young child and were to kill it right in front of you, because that's, according to historical Josephus, uh, describes that it was a bloody scene, that there were babies in the street who had been hacked to death. It was a horrible thing. Uh, but it was an act of a purely selfish megalomaniac, King Herod. And uh, so when we think about his love for power, if power is defined as the ability to control people and resources, to secure one's own destiny, then you just described Herod the Great. He was willing to do anything to control people and resources for the sake of power so he could achieve his own goals and earn the name that he loved so much, Herod the Great. Herod was not a buffoon when it came to politics. He was a capable man. Uh, he uh, wiped out several bands of gorillas which were not only <clears throat> troubling the Roman uh, centurions and legions in the area, they were troubling the people of, of, of the Jews. And uh, he went out and, and uh, wiped them out. Uh, he, he used subtle diplomacy to appease different factions in the Galilean countryside. He was a man who understood the ins and outs of, he was what you call a career politician. But Herod was not only capable, he was crafty. Because he arranged everything as a conduit for power. Every, he never entered into a relationship, according to the historians, that did not suit his pursuit of power. That's the kind of leader that Herod was. He was a very crafty man. Herod was a very cruel man. He, uh, in, for the sake of power and protecting his own power, he killed his brother-in-law, 
His mother-in-law, no shouting. He killed his mother-in-law, two of his sons, and he even killed his wife. One of his wives. He had, he had ten marriages. Josephus, uh, the historian, dubbed him barbaric. Another historian dubbed him the malevolent maniac. And uh, that's kind of who he was. Because Herod had a tremendous preoccupation with power. But then I want you to notice, not only did Herod have a preoccupation with earthly power, Herod had a preoccupation with material possessions. Herod was the type of tetrarch or king that wanted everything Caesar had with the knack of a Donald Trump. He wanted it all. Uh, Herod built seven palaces uh, that, that history brings to us. He built seven theaters, one of which seated around 9,500 people. He even built the Jews a temple. He loved to see something beautiful. He had a knack, but of course, he was filled with greed. He had a real preoccupation with material possessions. He built stadiums for sporting events, one which, re which reputedly seated 300,000 people. Wow. You know, they, they, I, I was uh, reading here recently, and they said that upwards of 80 to 85 percent of the of the Middle East including Israel and others are yet to be excavated have not even been discovered yet and yet whenever uh, we, 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 we find things every day archaeologists find things every day over there but many places are cut off because of territorial boundaries and states and and, uh, and are off limits but but what we see here in all of these seven palaces and seven theaters and stadiums is that Herod was so preoccupied with material things. He was a king who was interested in, in the glory of what you could see with your eyes. But then I want you to notice that Herod had a preoccupation with prestige. History bears out that he loved to make an impression on others. History tells us that he built entire cities with state-of-the-art architecture and amenities. He built several cities that he named after his superiors. Uh, all of his marriages, ten of them, were prestige-oriented, and he once married the daughter of a leading rival to handcuff his rival's ability to challenge Herod. Wow. Poor wife. Talk about not marrying for love. But he did, he did all of these things because Herod was preoccupied with prestige. This is what Herod wanted. So, and we could go on and on and on and on and on describing the many things that he did. Herod was truly, if you look at it from the world's eyes, he had glimpses of greatness and brilliance about it. But he also had glimpses of insanity, which uh, sometimes genius and madness run really close. Together. And I think Herod possessed, possessed the liberal amount of both. But then I want you to notice that Herod had a preoccupation with paranoia. Now we've already described to you how he killed his brother-in-law, his mother-in-law, two brothers, one of his wives. Herod was so paranoid about his own life and his own kingdom that he would kill you just like that. You know what we need to do? I know things are not going that great in America right now, but we need to just take a moment and say, thank you, Lord, for the free country that I live in. Say it together. Thank you, Lord, for the free country that I live in. Because I'll tell you what, at least our government, they might chop your head off in private, but at least they can't come out and rip you out of your home and chop your head off on Main Street. Herod didn't have any problem doing that. But he had a preoccupation with paranoia. Herod's father was poisoned by an enemy. His father was also a king. And from that time forward, Herod was paranoid about secret ingredients ending up in his soup. He had ten thousands, literally ten thousands of slaves who built ten emergency fortresses, including Masada's palace. Ten, all heavily armed and well provisioned. He had an elaborate network of spies all throughout Galilee who sniffed out numerous assassination attempts or attempts to dethrone him. And those who opposed him were invited to a midnight swim in the Jordan with a concrete bathrobe. 
He ruled for more than 40 years. But he was the type of king that I just described, a man of the flesh. And then the day came when Herod met the king of kings, the little child that was born in the manger of which we are celebrating in this season. He did all right until he came into contact with the king of kings. So you see from, from what we've described, he, he was a man who <clears throat> embodied all the things that we glorify in America today. Think about it. We are preoccupied with power. We, you know, there's people, even though the Constitution is a thinly veiled protection against those who are grasping for more power in this country. And I could make some political statements, but I will not do that today. There are people in America, it is in the church, it is throughout the entire fabric of our culture, we are pursuing material things with a zest before unknown in this country. You know what? As God's people, we need to be pursuing Jesus with that zest, with that, with that passion. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to pursue material things. We're called to receive what God gives us as blessings and to be thankful for what we have. But we live in a world today that is in a mad rush for more. You know, we live in a world today that is, that is trying to, to exalt itself. There was a time in America when humility was a virtue and it was extolled publicly. But today, you know what is extolled publicly? People who gloat and people who brag and people who just exalt themselves. They're given the limelight millions of dollars to do it. You say, you really think that's happening? Oh yes, if you were to bring the generation from just 50 or 60 years ago and set them on this stage, they would say, I am shocked at what's going on today. I didn't grow up with this. I grew up with a country that said, you know, it's better to be humble. It's better to help your fellow man than to ignore him. It's better to give God the credit than to take it for yourself. But well, we live in a world today that's a lot like King Herod. And you know what we have? We have what the Bible described. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. You know what causes people to live in fear? When they're out of relationship with God. Because when we're out of relationship with God, we are in charge of our circumstances. And that is a job that none of us can handle. It's no wonder our hearts fail us for fear. You know, if Dwight was, and Sarah were in charge of their circumstances, they, they would have no hope but they put their circumstances in the hands of a loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Right. We have a world today that is, that is on more, pain, more, more depression medication. And, and, and I, I'm not here to say if you're taking depression medication, I might be next, but I want to tell you something. I'm here to say that our Heavenly Father doesn't want us to live in fear. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Amen. That's what comes from the Heavenly Father. I don't want to live like this king. I don't want this king to be my king. Amen? Amen. I don't want Herod to be my king. Amen. Let's talk about Jesus, the king of kings, this morning. You know, I'm so glad for Jesus today. I'm so glad for what he means in my life. You know, Satan, he comes to the door of my heart and he brings the love of possessions with him sometimes. He brings paranoia at others. He brings the desire for prestige and, and for affirmation. And he says, here, I offer you these things, but I have to shut them out, and I have to say, I'm only going to answer the door for the King of Kings, Amen. Jesus right. Christ. Right. I want to move on to the Scripture uh, in Isaiah chapter 8 this morning. And I want to let you know, first of all, there's only two things about Jesus, but they're powerful. Jesus, first of all, understood the purpose of power. You know... The real struggle in the world today is about power. It's about who's going to be in control. Because that's where the problem first began. Because Satan, Lucifer, looked up and said, I will be like the Most High God. And Jesus told the disciples, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Because the struggle was over who was going to be in charge of this universe. Apparently there was a time of of probation 
Just like we're on right now. We have the right to choose. Whenever the angels of God, the created beings, God so longed for people and for created beings to love Him because they wanted to, that He gave them a choice. And Lucifer and one-third of heaven's angels chose to say, I'll do it my way. They were thrown out of heaven. And Lucifer's new roost was here on the earth. But you know, the struggle really is about who's going to be in charge of this world. And we need to understand that every person has that same mini struggle, this mighty struggle that's going on above us. The mini struggle is, who's going to be in charge of my life? Is it going to be me? Or am I going to let the Lord have His way in my heart? We, if we're going to really truly appreciate Jesus, the King of Kings, we need to know what His view of power was all about. First of all, I want you to notice that Jesus governs for God's glory. You know, we need to allow our lives to be lived in such a way that God receives glory from our lives. Amen. You know, this is why we say if there's an issue in your life that you're questioning or if there's something in your life, uh, maybe an activity, whatever it is, and you're wondering, should I do this or should I not? Just simply say, what gives God the benefit of the doubt and what will bring the most glory to God? That's right. And I know we still have to think through the process, but giving God the benefit of the doubt answers a whole lot of those questions. Because in verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 8, he says, for un or rather he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And after he says Mighty God, in verse 7, he says that he came here, Jesus came here, when it comes to government, he came to order and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Do you know who he just described? He just described his Father. Because God is just. God is holy. And, and everything Jesus did while He was here on earth, He never one time said, I came to do my will. He said, I came to do the will of my Heavenly Father that sent me. He said, that, that's what I'm here for. And you know, Jesus understood that power, the King of Kings understood that real power was best served when it brought the God who created everything the glory that He deserved. Some people have said, well, God is a megalomaniac because He just wants glory all the time. You know what? Somebody deserves the glory. And it's not me. It's not you. It's not us. It's the one who created us. Whenever I, I think of all the innovations that are taking place in cars today, and SUVs and trucks, I think somewhere, somewhere behind the scenes... A guy who will never make it on TV because he's extremely homely and wears thick glasses and he thinks like a nerd just created a masterpiece. And then we bring out the young and the beautiful and we advertise it. And you know, we look at them and say, wow, you guys are awesome. No, they're not. They're actors. The guy who deserves the glory is behind the scenes in a cramped room on a computer doing this number and you and I would be very bored around him really quick because he's a genius. He's an engineer. Not all over that way. I know I'm stereotyping here. But I want to tell you something. God deserves the glory for all the blessings we have. We have a tendency to step out and say, look what I have. Look what I've done. But it's God. Thank God he doesn't wear thick glasses and he's not staring at a computer. He's glorious. He's powerful. He's mighty. And he is just. The day is coming, people. And we have to remind ourselves this, that every crooked thing that happens in the world and in the church and in people's lives, God will make it straight someday. Hallelujah. Don't forget that. If you forget that, you get discouraged. But when we remember that God is going to receive ultimate glory because, because the Scripture says that every knee is going to bow. That includes Lucifer. That includes every atheist. That includes every, every evolutionist who doesn't believe in God and who thinks everything is a rant. 
Everybody is going to bow the knee. Hitler's going to bow the knee before God. And say, Jesus, you're King of Kings and you're Lord of Lords. It wasn't me and it wasn't anybody else. It's you. Jesus governs for God's glory. Herod governed for His glory. He did everything he could to grab power and receive praise. But Jesus governs for His Father's glory. But then I want you to notice that Jesus governs for our good. Hallelujah. Not only does Jesus govern for, our, for God's glory. You know, when God gets the glory, we get the blessings. Amen. Amen. I've said that before, but it's so true. Notice, first of all, a word he used. He said, His name shall be called Wonderful. One, one definition of wonderful is beautiful and beloved. You know, there's nothing like a leader that everybody loves. You know, and, 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 and this is my personal feeling, but I remember the pride that I began to experience after Ronald Reagan got elected. This is just me personally. I'm not here to espouse one, one party or the other, but I'll tell you what. I remember having a, a Thanksgiving dinner with my grandpa. He was a dyed in wool Democrat. An old grandpa. Uh, I was 17 and didn't have a clue what I was saying, but I just like to say a lot. And uh, we were over Thanksgiving dinner, and Grandpa was saying, I don't want no gun toting cowboy actor from Hollywood in the White House. I love my Grandpa. But I said, well, Grandpa, he's a good president. It's for your own welfare. He said, I don't want welfare. I want to work. <laughs> good old Grandpa. But I remember thinking to myself as we watched America who had planes who couldn't fly and ships could barely sail and morale that was down to nothing and all of a sudden a man came in here and I don't know if he did everything right but after he got shot he made a statement he said while I was in that hospital he said I realized that I had to do God's will for this country and he may not have understood God like you and I do, but somehow or another God spoke that into his heart. And he, there, was a, there was a spirit of pride in this country that rose up and caused the defeat of communism. Wow, what an accomplishment. But you know, Ronald Reagan, thank God, had, had the understanding to say, and I know that his presidency wasn't perfect, but he had the understanding to say, it's God that I'm working for. I wish our... Our leaders would say that today, amen? amen? Because whenever things are governed for God's glory, then we're blessed. Not only does he say wonderful, but he says he'll be called counselor, wise leader. Folks, I don't know about you, but I need the counsel of Jesus in this world I live in today. There's so many perplexing problems, and you know the thing I've noticed... Uh, in years past, it seemed like I, I would have problems and then I would have a big perplexing problem and I would say, okay, Lord, help me, help me. But you know what I've noticed in these last 10 years especially? It seems like that not only do we have a few problems and a big perplexing, but it seems like there's a bunch of perplexing problems and they're getting more complicated. Amen. Lord, how in the world can we even possibly begin to solve this? But I want to tell you something. We have a king this morning who is governing for our good. He is our counselor from the right hand of the Father. Amen. He is here to give us wisdom when we need it. He is here to give us strength when we are weak. He is here to give us blessing when we need it. He is our counselor this morning. Amen. Counselor can also mean protector. It can be a, a, a term for attorney. We are protected from the justice of God's righteousness. We are weak and sinful by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our counselor steps up and says, Your holiness demands that they be punished, but I already took that punishment, Father. Your holiness is good, it's just, it's righteous, but I paid the price for their sin. Thank God for the government we have in Jesus Christ. He's wonderful. He's a counselor to us this morning. Then he's also the Prince of Peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. True peace. True peace. Jesus told the disciples on one occasion, He said, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. You know, before the ink is even dry, peace treaties are broken in today's world. How many times have we seen that happen? But when Jesus comes and brings us peace, it is a peace that passes all understanding. People don't understand it. 
People say, how can you be so peaceful in the midst of your problems? Because I don't have the world's peace. I have the peace that Jesus gives. Amen. Hallelujah. He said in verse 7, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. That's a real prince of peace. That's someone we can really trust this morning. I know that it appears that at times the, the peace that Jesus has promised to bring is being interrupted, it's being stymied, it's being thwarted. But I have some good news for you. It's coming, and when it finally arrives, it's going to envelop the whole earth. Praise God. Because Jesus governs for our good. You know, the older I get, and I was even praying this morning on the way to church, I was saying, Lord, I just want to bring you glory, and I just want peace. I don't want to be in turmoil over things that are I can't fix and I can't change and I can't solve. I just want to let you be in charge, Lord. Lord, just give me peace. And let me worship you today. That's all I want to do, Lord. I hope you feel the same way. Jesus governs for God's glory and Jesus governs for our good. But then I want you to notice something else about this King of Kings. Jesus was preoccupied with people. Hallelujah. Because first of all, He identified with our weakness because He said, For unto us a child is born. Jesus came into the world not as a fully grown king. He didn't even come into the world like Adam did. Adam was formed as a fully grown man. And Eve was taken from His side. She was a fully grown woman. But Jesus chose to come into the world as the weakest of His creatures. A little baby come into the world helpless, unable to defend itself, unable to make any decisions, unable to govern anything, not even its own bowels, just a baby. We were sitting in our small group a couple of weeks ago, and Leah was holding Ethan, and we were having a good time together. And all of a sudden, Ethan testified, and I don't mean with his mouth. It was hilarious. We all just erupted into laughter. And he was getting his money's worth. He really was. But I just thought to myself, you know, a little baby, so helpless, so beautiful, but yet so needy. And Jesus chose to represent himself to us as the neediest of all creatures. I was watching, um, I think it was on Animal Planet, Big Cat Diary or something. And they said that the, uh, the, the uh, antelope, when it is born, and the wildebeest, when it is born, they have to be ready to run up to 20 miles an hour to stay up with the lope of, of the herd within two hours of their birth. Think about it. Simply because of predators. And, and if, you know, they can't necessarily outrun them, the only other defense they have is just to be able to lay still in the grass. And hopefully the lion or the cheetah or, or the leopard, whatever it is chasing them, won't see them with a hyena. But you know, Jesus couldn't even do that. When he was a little boy, his, Mary and Joseph had to take him and they had to go to Egypt to protect him from Herod. He was helpless for a number of years. He grew up just like you and I did. With all the weakness. Because he wanted to come and be able to say someday, I know what it's like when you're suffering as a child. I know what it's like, little child, when you've been molested. I know what it's like when you've been left alone. I know, little child, because I was a child. He's the only representative in heaven that has any leftover residual effects of man's evil, and that is the scars in his hands, in his feet, in his side, and on his brow. And I believe we're going to see him. We're going to see him someday. And we're going to kiss those scars. And we're going to praise him for dying on the cross. And we're going to thank him for what he did for us. Because Jesus is preoccupied with people. The only time Herod was preoccupied with people was when they could bring him something that he wanted or they got in his way and he could eliminate them. 
Jesus doesn't operate that way this morning because He is the King of Kings. He not only identified with our weaknesses, he, had to, he understands our families because it said not only is a child born, but a son is given. Jesus loves your family this morning. You know, we live in a world that, that is minimizing the importance of the family, but God will never do that. It is God's desire for our families to be safe and secure and to be together and to be in His presence. Jesus loves nothing more than to be the center of your home. That's what Jesus loves. Because He understands our families. Because He is a son. And now He's a bridegroom. And He's our Father. Hallelujah. Whatever's going on in your family this morning, whether it's good, bad, and different, full of routine, whatever it may be, Jesus has a keen interest in what's going on in your family. Amen. Because He loves and understands our families. Right. Praise God. Praise. A child is born. A son is given. Then I want you to notice that He came to bring His protection. Because it said His name will be called, and it goes on down, Everlasting Father. You know, aren't you glad that we have someone to protect us? The older we get, the more we realize that we can't protect ourselves even like we used to. I mean, you know those dreams that you had when you were young and the big green monster was chasing and you could barely move your feet with your concrete boots? That's the way I live now. That's not a dream. If the big green monster comes, he's going to get me. But you know what? We have a Heavenly Father. We have a, a Savior, Jesus Christ, who knows how to protect us because He said, not only is He a child and a son, but He's an everlasting Father. Amen. He's not a Father that will be here today and gone tomorrow like some fathers are. He's a Father who will be here forever. Amen. And ever. And ever. Praise God. Who are we talking about this morning? We're talking about the King of Kings who was preoccupied with people for our good. That's the Jesus we serve. The question that I ask you this morning, and I'm going to share a little illustration in closing, but which king will you follow? You know, is, it worth, is it worth living like Herod? To have what we can hold in our hands for a very short time and then it goes to someone else? Or is it worth... Serving Jesus. The one who understands what power is all about. The one who knows that He came to help His Father balance power in this world and take it back to the one who rightfully deserves it. And He didn't just come and grab it. He bought it back through His precious blood and through the empty tomb. And He stepped on the neck of the devil and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave and said, Now those precious people belong to Me, devil. Somebody had to pay, and I was willing to step up and do it. Because I am the King of kings, and I am the Prince of peace. I love it. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Herod is in the grave today, and we don't even know where his grave is. But Jesus is on the throne. Because it says, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And then he said, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. Herod had a lot of zeal when it came to his stuff. And his own will and his own prestige and his own power. But he wasn't able to overcome death. Thank God our King did. Amen. I was reading the story of two companies. In 2003 there was a CEO that had a failing company he became the new CEO. And he thought, well, I have a great plan. We're going to really overcome it. We're going to really bounce back. And so what happened was, he said, but to do this, we're going to have to cause a thousand people to lose their jobs. 
People swallowed hard, but thought, okay, maybe this is what happens. But then he made a decision. He said, now, to kind of prepare the executive team for the great days that are coming, we're going to spend a million dollars and remodel the executive floor, top floor. And they put in all kinds of, of uh, luxuries and, and uh, some of these, some, some sensitive soul in the executive started taking pictures with their iPhone and it got out. And the people began to see the luxury that was taking place. He began to be known as the prince, CEO and cronies, you know. And the company ultimately failed because he lost the loyalty, dedication, and hard work of the people who made the company go. But in 2005, there was another company. A new CEO came in, very similar circumstances. And he was forced to lay off a few hundred people. But he did something different. He came and he had an, inter an interview, and, and there, there was a video interview of it. And in the interview, you could tell the man at least appeared to be extremely sincere. And he said, I want to apologize to all those families that we had to lay off their workers. He said, it is our desire to rehire them. The company was near bankruptcy. He said, but I want you to know that I am taking a 25% pay cut and everybody on the executive staff, there will be no bonuses, there will be no stock options for us. He said, this company has got to, got to have a, a revival. And he had publicly apologized for what happened. His priority, the, the priority of the first CEO was for himself and his team. But the priority of the second CEO was for the company and its employees. And he eventually ended up rehiring those 100 people that he had to lay off. He stripped the executive to the bare bones. That is exactly what Jesus did. He laid aside his glory. He laid aside his riches. He became poor, the scripture says, so that we could become rich. That's the CEO, hallelujah, that you and I are serving this morning. Are you glad for Jesus today? Amen. I don't know about you. There, there's a lot of kings, potentates, prime ministers, presidents, and corporate directors of piddlies that think they're really something. But the only one that really matters is Jesus Christ because He knows how to handle power and He knows how to love people. Amen. If the truth were known, if you and I, every one of us, got what we deserved, we'd be lost and in hell this morning, wouldn't we? We'd be without hope. But Jesus came down and said, I'm taking a huge pay cut and there won't be any bonuses for me. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take the biggest cut of all because I'm going to give my life so that these people can have eternal life. That's the CEO I want to follow this morning. How about you? If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the lesson we've learned about the tale of two kings. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the